Welcome to IREB Resistance Radio, where we discuss the resistance work going on in Minnesota's 2nd Congressional District. IREB is an indivisible group formed after the 2016 election in opposition to an executive that we feared was going to do grave damage to our country. As our fears have been proven out, so has our membership grown. We attract people from across the political spectrum, but make no mistake, we are united as a progressive force in Minnesota's politics. Join us on our Facebook page, search for The Indivisible Resistance of Egan and Burnsville. Okay, welcome to uh, the next IREB podcast. Um, today with us, we have our regular contributor, Dave Rugg, and a special guest, Senator Jim Carlson from Senate District 51 is with us. Welcome, Jim. Hello, everyone. Hello, Mark. Thanks for putting me on. Hey, thanks for coming on. Uh, we asked Jim to come on as we today's discussion is going to be around some of the work that's going on in the legislature, the state level. And Dave has been doing a lot of work with the House. And of course, Jim's been serving in the Senate. So this should be a real interesting conversation. Um, before we get started on a few things, though, I did want to introduce Jim a little bit. Jim's my state senator. He serves here in Senate District 51. Um, he uh, works uh, um, uh, in, in the Senate, and his two House uh, members that, that he works closely with are uh, Lori Halverson and Sandy Mason, both great representatives down here in Senate District 51. Now, one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Jim on today is he is a really interesting guy. And I, I've marched uh, in, uh, had the luck to march in a couple of Jim's parades over the last couple of years. And one of the things that I really was impressed with, and I wanted to talk first about a couple of those types of things. One of the things I was really impressed with is we walked down the street and we would walk, we'd do those praise. How much people love you. I mean, my goodness, uh, you know, the work, and I know your sisters really well, Lynn and, and the others. Um, and, and, and I know this is a family thing, um, but you know, you guys have really done a lot of work. There you are, a, you are a trusted politician in, in this area and you've been here for a long time and you've grown up and actually um, I, today I learned that uh, from the wiki page that you actually have a wiki page and, and it listed you as uh, growing up on a farm. And I thought, oh, that's weird. And then I realized, oh, I knew that, that the Carlson family farm yep. is basically what Egan was. Isn't that right? It was Central Egan, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's a farm where my great-grandfather settled back in about 1916. And then my grandfather had it, and then my father had it. And my father said to me one day, you're not going to be a farmer, are you? And I said, nope. <laughs> so he became a developer and we built houses on it. Yeah. And so that's kind of where, where, where that got. And so then um, actually I'm going to refer to your wiki page because, you know, there, there was so many, so many interesting things. Well, I, I want, I'm, get, I'm kind of getting out of place. So the, the, um, I wanted to bring you on primarily uh, because uh, I've seen you at a, a a hundred meetings, if I've seen you at a single one, uh, the Senate district meeting, uh, you know, fundraisers of various things, uh, you know, uh, uh, meeting the conventions. And, and the problem that uh, all we always run into is Jim always gets like the last couple of minutes as he's running in the door with a big stack of papers in his hand. And, and we, and we don't ever get a chance to really, um, you know, sit down and talk with him. So today I wanted to give him a little extra time so that he can finish all of his stories without having to rush through them before the end. Um, with, like I said, with us today is Dave Rugg and, and, and Dave is going to help us with a few questions as well. But um, what I want to start with is, okay, so Jim, you were born uh, here in Minnesota and, and you grew up uh, in Egan and, you know, you have the family farm there. I mean, you, did you ever actually do any farming? Did you ever actually? Well, you bet. Yep. So, I spent a lot of time on the tractors. Yep. So uh, plowing fields, stuff like that. Uh, did yep. you have any livestock? Oh, yes. We, uh, we stopped milking when I was about... Uh, four or five years old, and then my father uh, raised beef cattle. And then we stopped with the beef cattle about uh, the same time I got out of high school, and we still had cash, you know, cash crops, uh, soybeans, corn, uh, mainly, uh, and then some, some hay also. We had uh, about 120 acres, something like that, and about a little more than half was tillable. And that's, that's right down by where you and, and Lynn live right now, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. Oh, that, that, that's, that's great. Okay. So the other thing um, that, that I um, am really impressed with is how much work you do in the legislature. I actually took a look at the bills and, you know, I was looking at one page and, and you know, the bills that you personally authored and I was like, oh my God, this guy's done so much work over his career. And, and it, no, this was just this year, you know? <laughs> and so, I mean, you know, what, you are certainly, and I've commented on this before, I'm so grateful to have you in the legislature because you, you have such great attention to detail. Um, 
why don't you talk a little bit about what it's like to work there for us? It is a lot of work, let me tell you. I'm, I'm an engineer and I worked at Ecolab for just under nine years. And then I went to 3M and worked for 20, a little over 20 years and uh, worked hard, did a lot of traveling, did a lot of, you know, a lot of things. And you give up a lot when you uh, work at a large corporation like that and working in a fast paced manufacturing environment. But when I went into the legislature, I was shocked at how hard you really have to work. And I, you know, I was not able to, well, let's say I was able at 3M if I needed to go golfing, if I needed to stay home late, uh, if it snowed a little bit, if it, you know, just didn't feel like going to work and feeling a little off, you can't do that in the Senate. You can't, you can't leave your constituents hanging if they need to meet with you. You have to be there to vote. You have to be there to work on bills. And then throughout the interim, like right now, you're still answering phone calls, answering lots of emails. The, uh, and when you, you come in, the amount of information you don't know is just so huge that you know, I'm going into my 11th year in the Senate and it's still a steep learning curve. I, you know, I was first elected in 2006 and uh, then was unelected in 2010 and then got back, back in in 2012 when people realized their mistake. Yeah. And uh, it's always been a learning experience. You kind of attack new things each time. And then we had the experience in the last two years now of being in the minority. And you mentioned the number of bills that I personally sponsored and that I co-authored. Now, when you're personally sponsoring, you expect to get those through. But with the last two years with Republican leadership, they didn't want to hear any bills that were authored by a Democrat. So I only had chief authorship of 50 items. Some of them are not really bills, they're resolutions to award people uh, Eagle Scout, things like that. But uh, my, uh, the personal bills that I had heard in this last year was one, just the hands-free cell phone bill. And that was actually a carryover from 2017. And we got it so close this year, but in, in my view, because there were more Democratic yes votes than there were Republican yes votes in both the House and the Senate, the Republicans would not bring it up for a final vote. That's, yeah, that's uh, uh, terrible. And I've heard this story before. Um, this hands-free bill is something that you've been working for a long time on. Do you want to talk a little bit about like what, what got you started on it and what, you know, what your drive is with that? I know it's something that you care about uh, very deeply. Yes, I, I signed on to it as a co-sponsor in 2008. Terry Bonoff from the Western Suburbs was the original sponsor of it. And she signed on to it. I think somebody asked her to do it. And then she was looking for co-sponsors. You can have five uh, chief author co-sponsors on a Senate bill. So I signed on. And then during the, uh, the session, Terry said, well, would you like to carry the bill? Uh, because I'm, I'm not going to push it through. So I carried it in uh, 20, uh, let's see, that would have been, I ended the session in 2009 and uh, it lost in 2010, but I, I was still there in 2010 and actually uh, re-entered the bill then. And uh, then I lost in tw the 2010 election. So 2011, 2012, it just laid by the wayside. No one picked it up. And then in 2013, I had... Uh, the Burnsville High School seniors from the government class in there. And I was always polling the young people to find out what they thought about hands-free cell phone bills. And they, I actually showed it to them and I, I had it written up, but hadn't introduced it yet. And I said, do you think I should introduce this? And overwhelmingly, the students said, yes. So that, that was a shock to me because I thought young people love to talk on the phone while they drove. And uh, so I dropped the bill in right then, and I've done it ever since. And this last year now, uh, we actually had a Republican chief author at, in the House. And we thought maybe that would bring it over the, over the threshold. But uh, lo and behold, there was a political objection to it. And in the last couple of days of the session, uh, they wouldn't hear it over in the House, and I knew that Paul Gazelka would not hear it because I was a Democrat. 
and they killed it in the house by voting it down. So that was the huge, huge disappointment and a huge disappointment to the number of families that I have gotten to know that have lost their loved ones. And again, <clears throat> the bill is only to prevent people from using their handheld cell phone to their ear. They can still talk in the car as long as they use a Bluetooth or an embedded system in the car. And you can even set your phone somewhere out of sight and use an earbud and a microphone. You, you know, a lot of the newer phones now you can dial by microphone. You can uh, listen through an earbud. And by the way, you can only do it with one earbud because it's illegal to use headphones in the car. Sure. And <clears throat> but it has been illegal to uh, use texting in the car. And that's one of the things that the police were complaining about is that people would have their phone down on their lap and be texting and looking down. Yeah. And that's actually more dangerous than talking with your hand up at your ear. And people were, some people were denying that they were on their phone. Others would pick up their phone and hold it to their ear, even though they were texting, <laughs> because holding it to your ear is not illegal and texting is. So oh. we had law enforcement that was soundly on our side. Yeah. They said, we have a hard time diagnosing if people are texting or if they really are, are talking on their phone. So that was the, you know, we had the Sheriff's Association, the PPOA, that's the Police and Peace Officers Association, and uh, police chiefs uh, everywhere were in favor of this, as well as some really different groups like the realtors, where, you know, and you think that realtors use their phones all the time in the car, but because they use them a lot, they use the most modern phones, which are the Bluetooth ones. And one realtor was killed on a motorcycle when he stopped at a stoplight and a person on her phone ran into the back of him and killed him. So the realtors were strongly in favor of the bill. Truckers strongly in favor of the bill. Well, who was opposing? I mean, other than, you know, the Republicans who oppose everything that we want to do. I mean, it was there, was there any reason given for why? No, <laughs> there was one person who wrote about it and actually testified against it. And he didn't say exactly why he was opposed to it other than maybe libertarian issues. And he kept saying in front of uh, the, the uh, committees that not one person has proven to be killed by a person having their phone to their ear. Jeez, yeah. That was his only uh, reason for opposing it. But otherwise, there was no one who actually opposed it and would articulate why and no science to to no, refute. no. yeah we and we had um we had some um, uh you know face false accusations one person once said that uh, at&t is against it and they're working against it and i happened to go to the an at&t store open house when they were uh, had a ribbon cutting and they said absolutely not we are for it in fact we've been loaning our simulator to some of these groups in, in schools so that they can experience what a, a distracted driving for five eight seconds would do to you how far you can travel on the road and so they were absolutely for it so I couldn't find anyone who was soundly against it again the, the real reason I think that it didn't pass is that it was the wrong party that was um, in favor of it. Okay, so that brings me to a big question that I have, and, and, and I, <clears throat> I pay attention to, you know, the folks that are actually doing the service work, like yourself, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, I've been paying attention, I mean, you, you, you well, you, we know each other well, um, and, and I pay a lot of attention to, you know, what Trump's doing, and I, and I, I don't think it's any secret that I would really believe that he's a compromised criminal. Yes. Um, so, you know, and so the things that I see coming out of the White House are terrible. I, I just, you know, I, I, this, this only makes sense if they're all criminals. I have to ask, you know, and, and, and you know, working at the state level, I mean, are, are, are we experiencing that same level of dysfunction that we are seeing at the federal level? We absolutely are. Um, one of the problems that, uh, and uh, I think we experienced it before it was really diagnosed in Congress, but last November, John McCain got in front of the camera and said, when are we going back to regular order? Right. 
Now, most people don't understand what that means. And what it is, regular order is the process of bringing bills to each body and then having and using the two bodies and the two parties in each body to have a compromise bill brought to, to a vote. And then once the House bill is passed and the Senate bill is passed, then you, you select and uh, have a conference committee that works out the differences. And it's very simple and very smooth, and it's not nonpartisan. Well, the, if you notice, uh, when Trump got in there, they started writing bills on, all on their own and then dropping them on the House or on the Senate without prior negotiations. And, you know, of course, everyone runs to their corners then and, you know, just digs in and won't compromise. The Minnesota legislature was doing the same thing. And that started the first day of the 2017 session. Because what happened is we, and we really have only a one, or they had only a one vote majority in the Senate on that first day in 2017. And, but what they did is got together and picked committee populations that were very lopsided. Now, there's a Senate rule that says that you're supposed to have the committees populated by the same, roughly the same uh, distribution as the floor is populated. With a one vote margin, that would mean that each committee should have a fairly equal number. And you know, you always round it off. So there'd be a, at least a one full vote advantage in each committee. Well, some committees were stacked two to one. So what would happen is that every Republican bill would be, first of all, the chair gets to decide what comes up for hearing. And so the chair would filter out all the bills except those that uh, maybe have, uh, you know, just no political influence, uh, you know, very straightforward ones or that they would be embarrassed that they didn't hear. And if the uh, if the Republicans wanted to pass it, they had the votes every time. If they wanted to kill it, they had the votes. If they didn't want it amended, they had the votes. They could even have one person not attend a committee, and still they would have the majority of the votes. So that's what happened then where um, most of the bills that were heard in the 2017 and then 2018 session were just Republican bills. And some of them were actually bills that Democrats had introduced before, but Republicans introduced the same bill and then heard that same bill. That happened to Sandy Mason. It happened to Greg Lawson. It kind of happened to me, but not, uh, uh, not as bad as it did for them. So that's one of the problems with the majority being so, um, you know, majorities are powerful, but that's the tyranny of the majority. And we don't really have the, uh, the, uh, methods to you know to kind of end that tyranny well that's just the, that's actually the question is this, you know is this a tyranny is it i mean it's just are they are they just powerful conservatives that that are just doing what they want or is there something more sinister going on is there is there some a driving force there that we need to be careful of um you know that's a, that's a kind of a tough question to answer I, i'd answer if we were having a beer and off in the in the dark but okay. uh, i enough. would say yes there's a power play going on across the nation yeah. uh the powers that they're exercising and the rules that they're breaking are they fall under that type that you can that a majority can prevent changing those rules it uh, it's actually an anti-democratic move to do what they're doing yeah. It's anti-democratic to do what Trump is doing. I, I don't know where this playbook has come from, but you know, we, I don't know if we'll get to that bill, but that big bill that I carry around of oh, yeah. 989 pages had everything stuffed in it. It's an unconstitutional bill, but you get nothing done if you don't at least pass one bill. So they, the uh, governor said, you've got too much garbage in there. You've got policy and finance together. You've got unrelated issues in there. I'm going to veto that bill. And he lined out 117 deal breakers. And the Republicans looked at and changed about 60 of them, let the rest go, and even added new things in there. The governor vetoed it. And now they're using that big bill, and the governor's veto, as 
a criticism of the governor that he vetoed this, he vetoed that. He, and it was all in that big, huge, unconstitutional bill. Yeah. Well, all right. So um, speaking of bills now, we're, you know, and I wanted to have more time and I wanted to, I wanted to discuss that uh, bill a little bit, but I actually wanted to hop over to Dave because I wanted to give him a little time to talk about some of the work that he's got going in the house. And I, I was kind of curious what you might have to say about that as well, Jim. Uh, Dave, why don't you kind of give us a rundown of what you've got going on this week? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, thanks. Can I say thanks something before Dave? Oh, yeah, no, no, go right ahead, Jim. Yeah, I really appreciate Dave's posts on that and the information he gives us. It's real hard sometimes to get that kind of, of uh, quick, uh, digested version of what's going on in Congress. So I, I have to say I appreciate it so much. And yeah, so Dave's been a real great resource, and I'm glad to, that, that he's uh, got time to come on and, and give us these updates. Well, I, I appreciate your uh -oh. words, Jim. It, it's uh, very interesting to uh, learn about the bills, and that's kind of what drove my uh, activism at this point. Um, I did want to highlight a couple of things uh, that really speak to what you're talking about. One, in terms of the process, this week at the House of Representatives on the federal level, there are 55 bills going through the House just this week. And uh, the vast majority of those are being done under suspension of the rules. There's very little debate. And as you mentioned in our last uh, chat, Mark, uh, with all the craziness that's going on and all the things that are happening, uh, bills are getting passed, uh, laws are being made, and changes to our society are happening. And uh, a lot of people are not very aware um, of what's happening until it affects them directly. And, yep. These incremental and I, I just I did want to highlight um, three bills um, I actually put out a, a call to action on the CD2 Action uh, website Let me see if I can pull today. It, uh, it's set up as a calendar event. If you look at the calendar event on uh, CD2 Action, uh, as you know, the Republicans passed the tax bill a year ago, and uh, this week uh, they're going to solidify a lot of those uh, tax provisions in uh, three bills. And so if you scroll down just a little bit, well, here, let me see if I can, is that too small? That's probably okay, but uh, there are three bills there, and don't be fooled by the titles of those bills. These right here? Yeah, the Family Savings Act, the American Innovation Act, and the Protecting Family and Small Business Tax Cuts Act. Um, if you uh, look at each one of those, uh, they are all co-sponsored by uh, a, a large uh, group of Republican uh, lawmakers. Uh, no Democrats uh, at this point. And uh, as you see, they're highlighted the CBO estimates of the tax revenues lost uh, over the coming years. It's just going to add to the debt. And I, I did the numbers this morning. And when Jason Lewis took control uh, of, of his seat in uh, 2017 in January, the, uh, the federal debt was at about uh, $19.4 trillion. And I looked today and it was uh, 21.4, almost $21.5 trillion of debt. And uh, these three bills are going to make permanent a lot of the cuts from last year and are going to add to that debt. And while there may be some good provisions in those, um, uh, just overall, uh, they're very, very, uh, and this very bad bills. And uh, I've called my uh, representative today and we're urging people through this call to action to call theirs to... Uh, oppose those bills. They're likely to come up for the recorded vote uh, probably on Thursday. Okay, and this isn't even tax cut 2.0 yet. This is just solidifying the ones that they already had. Yeah, this is, they, you know, a lot of the Democrats are calling this uh, tax cut 2.0 because it's exactly what they're doing. Oh. And there's a, there's a lot more to come. Yeah. But, uh, but as I said, just to, uh, to pay attention to what's happening, uh, it's been a, a journey for me. Um, the news, uh, both local and uh, federal, really doesn't cover the day-to-day -day, uh, grinding work. Jim, as you pointed out, the, the, the amount of work that it takes. And I'm, I'm amazed. I'm amazed at what you do and, and how you do it and get it done just as a citizen trying to keep track. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. And so these three bills are likely to be supported by Jason Lewis, and they will make our website uh, MNO2 Congress Watch next week once we get the final uh, numbers, see how the rest of, uh, of the Minnesota representatives vote, um, and they'll be added to our list. 
and uh, and between tracking Jason and uh, trying to keep track of what's happening on the federal level, um, it uh, it keeps me busy. And and the work you've done is awesome, Jim. Do you got any? Uh, That's incredible. It is incredible. I've I've not had anybody uh, come out with such a clear description of what's going on in Congress, and I really appreciate this. That's. I, I don't know how we can get more of this kind of information into the hands of the people who are maybe concerned, but their eyes glass over when you get into any detail. I had a conversation with a neighbor a few days ago where I was trying to mention that big bill and how things get stuck into it. And she was just saying, uh, uh, Jim, you know, I, I don't understand. Uh, my eyes are glassing over. And I thought, oh boy, this, <laughs> You know, unfortunately, this is your retirement. This is your education. This is your, your tax policy. This is everything. And I don't know exactly how I can get it uh, clear enough so that it's interesting. Uh, you know, like a lot of people say, polit you're not, you may not be into politics, but politics is into you. Yeah, that's no, it's, a, it's a great point, Jim, and it's one that our team for at uh, MNO2 Congress Watch is going to try to tackle. We, you know, we built the the Jason Lewis tracking website, mainly for the activism for this uh, campaign cycle, uh, obviously uh, to help uh, Angie Craig and uh, and those folks uh, uh, through the election process. But uh, and we've we've told uh, Angie that uh, when she's in Congress, we're going to continue the website and continue to track her votes and hold her accountable. But we're also going to try to tackle that very thought: How do we? get this information because I am really energized by what I'm learning about what's happening to me, my family, my life through these bills and, uh, and how can we uh, make it uh, fun, make it yes. easy for people to understand so that, uh, so that state legislators can use the information so people can use it to be more informed and uh, become more involved in our political system. And uh, yes. so we're, we're going to be thinking about that. If you have any ideas, let me know. Well, one thing I think, Dave, that it has to start early. We have to start in the schools to have people get introduced to their to more civics, to realize what laws are affecting them, and how internationally our country behaves versus other countries. Uh, as you may know, my my wife was a German teacher for thirty six years, and in Germany, it's just amazing how much civic. Uh, knowledge the kids have in school and young adults they're very involved yeah. and they know what pays for their schools they know who makes the laws they know all of their candidates even though we say we we kind of would like to have their types of elections where they're only a couple of months uh they already know the people a lot better than what we know our candidates so That's absolutely. Just a real quick story. I spent uh, two weeks touring uh, Ireland uh, a few years ago and had more in-depth discussions uh, in the pubs and the restaurants there than, uh, than I've had here. Uh, many, many instances where they knew way more about American politics. Than, uh, That's right. Yeah. Well, hopefully doing this uh, uh, podcast and everything that we can and the work that David's doing and, and Jim, I'm, I'm, you know, the work that you're doing is awesome. Um, you know, we will find a way to, to make this uh, to make this work again. Um, we've hit our uh, end of the amount of time that we have for this episode. I want to thank you both. Uh, Jim, I want you to come back. I'd like you to be a regular contributor if we could find time for you. I know you're a busy man. Same with you, Dave. Uh, you guys both do uh, awesome work, and, and I think it's important that we showcase that to the resistance community. So thank you both for coming on, and if you'll hold on one second, I'm going to play some music, and we are on our way out. Thanks, Mark. Thank you.